Hello everyone. So uh, my title here to introduce you is part of my PhD research, which is still in progress. And it's going to be mostly about paleodemographic um, research. Uh, the aim of the, my doctoral research is to contribute to the understanding of the social organization of the Paleolithic hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, my recent finds its roots in a paradox. Existing paleodemographic studies conclude that Pleistocene populations were characterized by a low demographic density and long-term stability. The great part of the existing studies are based on the quantification of artifacts, settlements, as their geographical distribution or frequency and distribution of radiocarbon dates, as well as paleo-DNA. There is a recurrence pointing out to environmental, technological, and biological constraints together with actualistic assumptions in order to, to explain this demographic pattern. This association is usually structured within the theoretical frame of Malthusian or Bosserupian arguments. This is population growth depends on the availability of resources or depends on the technological development. The first point to consider here is the interrelation between the mode of production and the human reproduction. It is as it is not possible to study one without the other. In principle, Pleistocene hunter-gatherer societies, in the best of the case, had little control on the reproduction of natural resources, defining inevitably a strong dependence on resources availability. If we consider that these populations followed a natural fertility, it would seem that mostly mortality rate would have been in charge of balancing the carrying capacity of the environment with the population's pressure but biochemical analysis do not seem to establish demographic bottlenecks to be a constant. We are lacking of archaeological sources to assess demographic and fertility patterns. In any book on demography, we will define demographic growth rate as a combination of fertility and mortality, as well as immigration and emigration movements. To some extent, we have mortality profiles, but we are missing the fertility profiles. There is the possibility to find a source of reference of information and materials for comparison from contemporaneous hunter fisher gatherers. However, social anthropology is very critic on this aspect. In Wilson's word, words, I quote, peoples living today who may be classified as foragers bear witness not only to their own lives, but to those of prehistoric foragers as well. That is not only, um, that is not only are living peoples conceived to be fit models for the remote past, but that remote past itself is said to establish the parameters of life of these living peoples." Unquote. My methodology is not based on extrapolations or a critical analogies. I am interested in finding observable patterns on their socioeconomic um, organization. As this is, for example, uh, from the contemporary um, studies, the observed gender division of labor and the, the social dissymmetry between men and women. We also come with several demographic studies, also from contemporary hunter-gatherer societies, from which we learn that different mortality and also fertility rates exist. And such data comes in contradiction with that of the Paleolithic um, studies. This variability among pre-industrial populations cannot be explained only with technological or environmental factors. No physic or biological law alone can explain the demography, nor the labor or production organization as they are uh, observed. And actually, when taking these two in combination, what emerges is a contradictory relation, as we have mentioned before, a delicate balance between resources and population pressure. From a Marxist point of view, we understand that any society is constituted historically from the workforce around the labor. Labor is the basic social activity that allows the continuity of a group within the main, with the main objective to obtain products. This sociality contains social strategies that assure the continuation of a specific society, as it includes not only the mechanism of production, but also the relation and processes for the subsistence and survival of the group. According to this, the mode of production of hunter-gatherer societies is characterized by a correspondence between workforce and social relations. Natural mortality and migration movements can release demographic pressure, but the biological capacity of human reproduction is still too high. In the same manner as social organization of labia is unquestionable, a social regulation of human reproduction among paleolithic societies may be also be considered. Reproduction is conditioned by the exposure to fertilization, which is for its part conditioned by the relations between sexes, which is socially regulated in any existing human society. By controlling the social relations, the woman's sexuality and fertility, it's possible to regulate the fertility outcome of an entire population. 
The organization of labor would have represented the means through which the social relations and behavior were controlled. The difference in the productive in the productive activities according to sex makes possible to relativize the value of the product obtained and by extension the value assigned to the person producing it. This is production offers a mechanism by which social inequality is possible and lastly pleasant. In other words, we may have here the long-term factor involved in the low demographic density and long-term demographic stability from the Pleistocene hunter-gatherers. And this would be my main uh, research question, whether Pleistocene hunter-gatherers had social mechanisms or social norms which had an impact on demographic growth and, by extension, the emergence of social inequality. As I mentioned, our methodology is based on an interdisciplinary approach. All variables and statistical case that we lack in the archaeological context, we take from different sources of information, including um, biological studies, ethnographic studies, and, and so on. Uh, by combining all these sources, we use a simulation program uh, which simulates demographic um, processes. Geographically, we are working with several foraging groups, including the Coasali from the northwest coast of North America, the Yamana and Selnam from Fireland in South America, the Yonu from North Australia, the Khoisan from South Africa, and the Seman from Borneo in Southeast Asia. While considering and taking into account ethnographic studies on others such uh, Hadza, Aceh, Akta, and so on. The routine we follow is the identification of different social events um, social practices, social behavior, which have an impact on the life course of people, specifically to their exposure to fertilization. The general pattern is as follows. Usually we find sex segregation at an early age, rites or ceremonies of passage for the transition into adulthood, which initiates the individuals to be eligible for, uh, for a union or marriage. Therefore, with the, in, within the frame of the union, starts the exposure to sexual intercourse and by extension then to conception. After the formation of a union, we find different possibilities. On the one hand, either the man or wife passes away. On the other hand, the union may be dissolved. None of these two situations leave the surviving or the separate individuals out of the reproduction engine, as they can remarry, an, can, they can remarry another spouse after a certain period of time. Another possibility which follows a union is the formation of additional unions. This is found in a polygamous marriage system. Finally, within the social frames of unions, the probability of conception will depend on several social and biological variables. In the case of an effective pregnancy, a birth delivery, as the birth delivery is, will return to the starting point of the map, also conditioned by social norms, as is the case of infanticide. As I mentioned before, we work with a multi-agent based system. Um, program, which is developed uh, by a colleague from Girona, Adria Vila Moreno. The program simulates demographic scenarios and the different social and biological constraints taken from the different sources I mentioned before. Um, basically, we have different input files which contain the different biological um, contexts or laws we could mention, the virtual community with the old individuals which are going to take part in the simulation, in capsules, we have other biological um, laws which weight a bit of the biological environment, and finally, the social norms we have collected from the sources. This simulation program um, works in what we would call steps. So we ask the program how many steps we want to simulate, and every step equals to a year. So if we ask the simulation program to develop 300 steps, that would mean we were going to get at the end a process of 300 years of demographic process. At the end of the simulation, we obtain different uh, output uh, files from where we can analyze the demographic process. Um, the different files uh, are three. Stat files, extended stat files, parish book files. Um, depending on each of them, we have different information which we can then work on with the X, um, Excel. Um, the stats file will look this way. Basically, it's a resume, a detailed resume of the entire simulation. We have all information of every step, and so afterwards we can simulate different demographic um, aspects, as is growth, um, growth rate, fertility rate, mortality rate, and so on. The extended stats is a detailed resume of the resultant um, virtual uh, community. That's the one uh, resultant of the simulation. And again, we can also simulate it, um, model the specific um, details of the society we obtain. 
And finally, the parish book is basically, again, a resume with some um, concrete um, aspects of the individuals they have been through, as is birth, um, marriage, and, and mur murder or death. Um, as it's a multi-agent program, each individual can act differently in each simulation, as there is an environment which can develop differently. That is why we need to simulate the same environment in different occasions just to see the variability within the same um, social context. Um, the program is still under development, but we have some interesting preliminary results. Here what you can observe is a growth rate from almost three, no, from 300 years of uh, demographic process. This specific context did not have any <coughs> social norm at all. Is just biological rules such as uh, maturation age, life expectancy, and a basic birth spacing. And what you can see is a cyclic um, graph in which every 30 years the population decreases and then rapidly increases. At the point where we incorporate some social norms, as I mentioned before, from the life course of individuals, we have a better, a greater variability within the different scenarios, as you can see in the screen. For example, the two at the bottom, the light blue and gray, they had the more restrictive um, social rules, which implied then this result of a low growth, uh, demographic growth rate. Finally, a very, another interesting detail to point is uh, what seems to be a magic fertility number. Independently of the simulations we have developed until now, um, most of the women after the, the reproductive lifespan they have have at least uh, eight children. Another thing would be how many of those will survive uh, infantile mortality, but still it's very interesting, this, uh, this number. Um, another thing interesting is, as I mentioned before, this variability. What you have here is different scenarios uh, with different um, social norms. On the one hand, at the point where for example, the KZ is the more relaxed scenario, and then you have this large variability of the different results of the about 30 um, repetitions of the simulation, while compared to the case uh, E, F, and G, which are shorter, the variability is shorter um, as a result of the more restrictive social rules. And then you can see also the tendency as you incorporate another social rule, which could be polygamous marriages or infanticide. So this is a bit the effect resulting on the simulations of the different groups we have tested until now. Um, as I mentioned before, it is still ongoing my research, but we do have some preliminary conclusions we can remark. Uh, we have seen that as comparing ethnographical and, and historical resources, uh, mm -hmm. sources, social norms affecting population growth are easily identified, and after we tested them, they have an, a positive um, effect. The specific socioeconomic organization leads to a social inequality between men and women, as I mentioned before, due to their own specific social organization, socioeconomic organization. Um, finally, from the experiments we have until now in, with our simulation program, population cycles emerge when there are no social norms applied, while variability occurs uh, at the point when we incorporate them, and then within these uh, different social scenarios, the more or less restrictive they are, the more or less variable uh, the results um, happen to become. And finally, the, um, the relevance of this research is then uh, explain the, the relevance of an ideological and a, a mechanism which has to be developed in, a, in this historical context in order to keep these um, populations with uh, stable demographic growth to not uh, putting to risk uh, the development of the and continuity of the societies. Finally, I want to also um, thank to all the people and institutions behind my my doctoral research, without which it would not be possible to have conducted all my research. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>